So as we have been going through uh, the uh, seasons of the year, uh, which are the seasons in the life of Jesus, uh, we have gone through Epiphany, as it is called, the revealing of Jesus, and now we look towards the season of His passion, His sacrifice, His death, and His resurrection. And as uh, part of that, we transition from uh, certain themes into a theme of repentance and preparation for what is often called the Passover season or the season of Easter or the season of uh, Jesus' suffering and his triumph in the resurrection. As we look at that, we uh, are led today to this section of scripture in Luke that deals with his time in the wilderness. And if we turn to Luke 4, we'll read this together and we'll ask, well, what does it have to say to us? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, as is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting he left him until an opportune time. Now, as we look at Jesus in this context, we realize that there's so much in this story, and we can't afford to go down too many rabbit holes. But one of the things that we should ask uh, and hopefully answer before the end of this sermon is, is Jesus really human? Is he fully human? And the answer that I'm going to give is yes, of course he is. Uh, he is the ultimate human being. He is, if you will, the way creation was supposed to be. There are no half measures about him. He is flesh and blood. And this has to be addressed because, of course, the earliest heresies were, no, he wasn't flesh and blood. Could Jesus be tempted? And the answer is yes, he could be. It says so specifically here. But then the response to that is, well, he doesn't, he's not really tempted as I am tempted. Uh, he, there was never a chance that he could fail. Well, okay, well, we'll address that question as well. But we'll also address the question is, how does he succeed? And we see him as both fully human and the way humanity is supposed to be. And in Jesus' example here in the wilderness, we realized that he has just come from the River Jordan, according to Luke's narrative. Uh, we know for, we have also read the book of John, uh, that, well, there were a number of things that happened. And that after his uh, baptism, which he participates in, he, he submits himself to, he requests, because he is the representative of all of humanity. We're told that the first Adam introduces corruption and introduces sin and is broken and falls. The second Adam, Jesus, brings us out of the fall and causes us, if we are with him and follow him, he causes us, he takes him, us with him into life. Um, and we won't go too, further, too much further into that subject, but uh, in very simple terms, Paul explains that we were all dead in trespasses and sins. But in being joined to Jesus, we have been raised into life. And so this is sort of a bit of a mystery to us. 
But we come to understand that just as Adam is the representative for all of humanity when things go wrong, the second Adam, the covenant man, is the representative who bears all of humanity in his wake, on his shoulders, in his heart. And he raises us to life. And he is the one who sets us an example here of the ultimate reality as to how we enter into life and have been brought into life. So let us go back and look at how this story speaks to us in what is simply a matter of Jesus facing temptation. And in facing temptation, let us first of all realize that this story is layered with symbolism and insight and is given to us to bring us the ultimate truth. It tells us Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Let's not, you know, get too far down the, uh, the rabbit hole and say, well, did anything else happen? You know, which John, of course, addresses, addresses at great length. And the first question we would ask is, was Jesus human? And the answer to that is, yes, he was. He is fully human. This is why we celebrate uh, at the season of the incarnation, the fact that God is incarnate. He is in flesh. And that everything about him, if he, if, if he cuts his finger, he bleeds. Uh, if he becomes weary, he can become irritated. Uh, if he becomes exhausted, he has to sleep. If he doesn't eat, he becomes hungry. But it tells us that he is full of the Holy Spirit. Now, we could, again, go down a rabbit hole here because there are those who will say that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit comes to us in measure and uh, you can be half full, uh, which is to be, say, you're half empty. Um, you can be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, but then you can be experiencing what is called the second filling of the Spirit. These are all sort of human terms to try to explain something that is still partly a mystery to us. But in very simple terms, Jesus, who is fully human, is fully in touch with the divine. And it's expressed as says, full of the Holy Spirit. I guess we, in English we could say surrounded, encompassed, engaged, connected, totally and completely in harmony with, however you want to say it, the Holy Spirit. He is connected with God the Father. We read recently about Jesus spending time, if it was last week, in prayer. Uh, and that, uh, that was the occasion when he was transfigured. And his disciples who were there on the mountain, James, Peter, and John, what were they doing? Having a nap. Uh, they are not fully engaged in prayer because for them it's something that is not quite natural and normal. Prayer is something that the priests do. Uh, connecting with God is something you do through a sacrifice. Uh, you know, being reconciled to God is what the high priest does once a year. And all of this experience is prior to the coming, in quotes, of the Holy Spirit, and they coming fully and completely alive to God in that connectedness. Uh, Jesus begins from the very moment of conception because he is God and it says Mary is with child of the Holy Spirit. So uh, while he is fully human, he is also fully connected and fully divine. And so after his baptism and the declaration, this, recognize this individual is my son. And he just didn't become my son right at this moment. He has been my son from conception. And he has grown up, which is why, of course, when he's 12 years age, he says and say, one day I'm going into my father's business, right? And when his parents say, what are you doing here arguing the law with the, uh, with the priests and the, the scribes? Uh, he says, I must be about my father's business. You know, he's already his father's son and he begins to understand it as he comes, you know, to this realization as a human being. He knows that this is his reality. Uh, but now he leaves the moment, according to Luke, of his baptism, and he goes off to face for us the realities of what it is to be in the wilderness. Jesus, it says, is in the wilderness. And, of course, here the symbolism is pretty obvious because the Son of God, Israel, who am I have drawn out of Egypt to be my son, the prophets say, 
The Son of God who failed spent 40 years in the wilderness. The Son of God who is to succeed spends 40 days in the wilderness. Echoes of Israel? Of course. Uh, 40 is that number of trial and testing. You know, for Noah, it rains 40 days. For Israel, it, Goliath taunts them for 40 days. For Israel, they wander for 40 years. And here Jesus spends his time of trial and testing, it says, in the wilderness. A wilderness that is, well, for all of us, this world. Jesus enters into the wilderness where, frankly, you're disoriented and you're disconnected and you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you're doing. Even to this day, uh, the wilderness between the Jordan and Jerusalem is, you know, you're, you drive from Jerusalem down to Jericho, down for a little further to the Jordan. And uh, once you do that, it says you're in Bedouin territory. You get into trouble uh, on the way from Jerusalem to Jericho, as that poor guy did. Uh, you can't call up the Jerusalem police, you know. Uh, well, you can, but chances are you won't get any help. You're in Bedouin territory, Bedouin law out there. And uh, it's, it's uh, kind of, well, you know, a long winding road, and you're glad you're in an air-conditioned bus. And you say, boy, I'm glad I'm not walking this path. Uh, when Jesus told the story of the man who went from Jerusalem to Jericho, the immediate response of his listeners was, what an idiot, you know. You know, of course you're going to fall among thieves. It's a wilderness out there. It's a jungle out there. Well, a very dry jungle bereft of vegetation. You know what I'm saying. It is not an easy place. But he has gone out there, it says, and he is facing a time of trial. The nature of this trial is, says, he was tempted. Now, at this particular point, you ask the question, well, can you tempt God? Well, no, but can you tempt Jesus, who is God in the flesh? That is to say, he is, um, he, he, he is subject to the same things you and I are subject to, hunger, weariness, and everything else. And uh, the answer is uh, yes, he can be tested, he can be tried, he can be pushed, he can be jabbed, he can be poked. The real question is, could God sin? Could Jesus sin? And the answer is yes. Now, the real question is, would he sin? And the answer is no, he wouldn't. Now, this may sound like a bit of a conundrum, but you could pose the question, this helped me. I remember one professor explaining it this way. He said, um, the, uh, the question is, could, I, could Bob take up smoking? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yes, I have lungs, I have access to a convenience store, I could buy cigarettes and I could start smoking. Would I take up smoking? And the answer is, no. Uh, it's nothing personal, but I find the habit abhorrent, uh, you know, on every level. Uh, you know, polluting your body in that way, uh, my body is a temple. Don't laugh, okay. All right. Um, you, you had to laugh, I know that. But I, I gasp and wheeze. I don't like being around smoke. Now, I don't despise smokers, but I despise the habit. I think of the rack and ruin it brings to the medical system. I think of the number of uh, days lost in the workforce because of the ill health. I think of those who are lucky enough, like George Burns, to smoke cigars and live to be 99. And then I think of those who are unlucky enough to get lung cancer from secondhand smoke. It is a devastating, nasty habit. Now, look, quite a few people in my extended family were smokers. They, they, they quit. I got one that's still a hanger on, and I nag him occasionally. But the point is, the chances of me taking up smoking are zero, okay? Uh, could I become an alcoholic? Yes, I could. But the chances of me becoming an alcoholic are zero. And I'll tell you why. Once upon a time, I got a little bit too over the top with alcohol. 
You say, well, you must have been a very irresponsible young person. And the answer is, yes, I was. I was 27 at the time. How did that happen? Well, I came home from a long day, and, uh, uh, you know, you may find this odd as well, but gin and tonic over ice on a hot day, yeah, it's very pleasant. And so I chugged it into a big glass, and I chugged it down to slake my thirst, and that was a stupid thing to do because I became giddy, a little disoriented, and I thought, whoa, I shouldn't have done that. And uh, a little voice answered me and said, yeah, that's right, you shouldn't have done that. How do you feel now? Not very good at all. And after that conversation, I said, I'm never doing that again. Now you may say, well, do you ever drink beer? Yes, in the summer. Cold beer, a gift from God, as far as I'm concerned. Well, do you have to drink beer every day in the summer? Cold? I could, yeah. Uh, what stops you? And the answer is the price. All right. Why don't you drink it 365 days of the year? It doesn't make any sense in winter. Oh, so you're not addicted to it. No, no, I can live without it. Uh, if you have a choice to make between buying a six, you know, a couple of dozen beer or a, uh, a, a, a ribbon for, or, or an ink cartridge for your printer, which is the choice? Well, it's the printer, of course. Why? Because I use the printer, you know, every day for hours on end, it seems, some days. So that's more important to me. So is there a chance that I would ever become an alcoholic? The answer is, well, no, not really. We got bottles of wine on a wine rack, and they just sit there because I like the decor. And I, you know, it's too much trouble to take the cork out. You know, you even say, that's, that's stupid, isn't it? Well, it's just the way my brain thinks. So the chances of me sort of becoming an alcoholic are like zero especially since I've gone through life and I haven't turned into one yet. How about becoming addicted to cocaine? That's interesting. Would I? Could I? Hmm. How do you enjoy the high? Have you ever been high in your life? Well, yeah. Believe it or not, I've enjoyed the high of uh, running. You know, run a couple, three miles, you know. It felt really good. It felt actually exhilarating. I enjoy the high of creativity. This may not make sense to you, but when I you know, learned to frame something uh, or I learned to put paneling on a wall, I stood back and said, I did that. That's really, really great. Uh, I've known the high of, you know, it's a really mundane process to go through writing something. But after you've written it, and you've edited it, and you had somebody else criticize it, and then you got it to where you think it's perfect, and then it goes to an editor, and he hashes it around a little bit, and then he says it's okay, and then it gets published, and you see your name in print, or as I did a few times, I wrote script, and the, uh, at the, you know, the credits roll up at the end of the TV program, and it says written by Bob Millman, total and complete high. So when I talk to Drug addicts, I told you the story of meeting the rather famous and accomplished jazz saxophonist, Art Pepper, and listening to him talk about how it felt to do heroin, and uh, thinking at first, you know, uh, what it would be to get him on camera for an interview, and then him, you know, asking him very simply, well, you know, you never do drugs again, and him clarifying with me, you know, would I do drugs? I, if you were on a desert island and didn't all by yourself and you had a pile of drugs, uh, and you would never touch it again, would you? And his simple explanation, I'd be doing it every 15 minutes, man. That's what happens. You know, Leonard Coet put it perfectly uh, uh, about the story of cocaine. Everybody knows you live forever when you've done a line or two. The first time I experienced sniffing something up my nose, which is so simple to do, and feeling as though I had worked for a week and accomplished something, or run several miles and felt the adrenaline high, I would want to go back. I know that because, well, the first time I had chocolate, it tasted pretty good. I've been going back all my life. You know, okay, there are certain things that just attract me, and I, I know that there's part of me that can have that addictive personality. And so, boy, if I did a line or two, I would, I would probably get hooked. So, could I get hooked on cocaine? 
Yeah. Will I get cooked on cocaine? No, because there's another part of my brain that says, don't ever, ever, ever try that. Remember how you felt about chocolate? And you can say, I can leave it alone anytime. Can you? Uh, no, not really. Now put that like a hundred times more and think of a hundred times more the, the devastation and consequences to your life, to the people you love, to all of the hopes and dreams you have for everything else in your life and think of how badly you could screw things up if you did this. Is there any chance? Now, as you look at Jesus and you ask, what are the chances he will give in to temptation? And then ask the question, where does his motivation come from? And what defines him as he is, quote, full of the Holy Spirit, encompassed, it's totally connected with his Father in heaven, totally the perfect fullness of creation, just the way that things began. They began in the garden, in a perfect environment. And it began with our covenant man, Adam, walking and talking and communing in the cool of the evening with his creator, his parent. Jesus is that. Okay? He is motivated. In fact, he is motivated by what? The spirit that motivates the Godhead. The father loves the son. The, lo the son loves the father. They are the unity of the spirit. And so Jesus is shown as, quote, full of, consumed by, immersed in, connected with, moving with the spirit. This is what motivates him. And so he can be tempted, but the chances of him giving in are zero. And you try to think of that. You say, well, are there any human examples of that? You know, even humanly, we can rise to a certain level of incredible sacrifice. You know, when I went to Yad Vashem, there was a, a, a statue of a school teacher, a Polish school teacher, and there were rocks placed, as is the tradition. You know, you don't put flowers on a, on a memorial or a grave. You put rocks if you come from the desert. And I looked at that, and I thought, who is this guy who is immortalized in this this statue, a Polish school teacher. And when the Nazis came in and said, take all of these Jewish kids that you're teaching and bring them to the railway station, he knew where they were going. He knew what their fate was. And he was required by the Nazis to calm them and leave them peacefully to the cattle car where they would climb on and they would be taken away and never seen again. And the reason he's immortalized in Yad Vashem is he led them very peacefully and very quietly to the train station. And he calmed them and he peacefully settled them so there'd be no problem with the soldiers. They wouldn't be brutalized. Then he climbed on and he went with them and he died with them so that his children would not be frightened. Now, how a human being finds that within themselves, to sacrifice themselves for the peace and the calm of the children he cared for, I don't know. On the other hand, I know that there are mothers in the Ukraine right now who, when the, rock, when the, when the stones were falling down, took their children and sheltered them and turned their back to the destruction and I'm sure, as in any war, there will be found the bodies of women who died protecting their children. That's happening right now. Now, that school teacher, was there ever a time he yelled at his kids? I'm sure. Was there ever a time when he disciplined them too harshly? I'm sure. But for that moment in time, he rose to an incredible level of so loved he his world, that he gave himself for it. There are women right now who so love they their children, who will give their life in the hopes that their child will live on. Just for a moment, they will come to that point. Jesus lived at that point. He was the complete human as God intended. 
And in this story, we see him fulfilling that. And he has, we are told, gone into the wilderness to face the reality of desolation and evil. And the evil is that has flowed from the adversary, the devil, is there to take him on. But before he takes him on, it says he fasts. And now, let's not even go down this rabbit hole of saying, well, can you really fast for 40 days? Apparently, it is possible to, to go 40 days without food. Can you go physically 40 days without water? And the answer is eh, probably not, which is why it's not mentioned here. Um, now, of course, there will be those who say you can't argue with from silence. Okay, if it doesn't matter water, does it mention anything else? You know, as I, I remember one cynic who, who wanted to take everything literally said, well, by your reckoning, you can prove that the, he had this, that, or the other thing out there as well. No, no, you can't. It's a very simple, straightforward fact. In his fast, what was the point of fasting? It was to communicate that you are made of dust. And you, can, you, you, you came from dust, you're going to return to dust of yourself. And you have sustained by the product of the dust. You know, where does the cabbage come from? Out of the same dirt you did. You know, where does the, the radish come from? You know, okay, where did the meat come from? From the cow. Where did the cow get uh, the meat? You know, from the grass. All of these things come from the, the dirt. I came from the dirt. Uh, this last week, there were those who followed the tradition of what is called Ash Wednesday. All right? And they went and they had somebody remind them with ashes that they were fragile and frail and temporary and weak and they were going to return to dust. But their hope lay in what? I'm going to mark the cross on your forehead to remind you. From dust you came to dust you will return, but in Jesus and his love and his sacrifice, you can go to eternity. You know, that's probably not entirely accurate according to theologians who'd explain Ash Wednesday. I do know a little bit more about Shrove Tuesday because I grew up around people who like pancakes. Now, any of you have pancakes this last week? Okay, two people. All right, good for you. Uh, all right. So IHOP got your money, did they? <laughs> all right. Uh, pardon? A&W. They had pancakes for you. Oh, of course, they have pancakes every day. That didn't count. And you, you have breakfast most days at A&W. So it wasn't a theologically appropriate thing that you felt you needed to do. You just to do it any day of the year. Okay, good for you. So uh, Jesus is fully aware as that a man, he can die. But as the Son of God, he can be everything. And so in fasting, he sets this example. And of course, this is not something as the church we tend to emphasize very much. You know, if you ask me, Bob, when was the last time you fasted? I would answer flippantly, well, last night, which is why I had break fast this morning. Okay? But the idea of this is that, you know, humanly speaking, Jesus you know, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, which we looked through, you get to the end of it, and what are the exhortations he gives? The exhortations are, be generous with your alms, be vigorous, enthusiastic, and consistent in your prayers, and when you fast, you know, we, we skip over that one, uh, and for good reason. <laughs> We don't want to get trapped too far into the how often do you fast question because that's an embarrassing one. But here is the point that in fasting, Jesus is stating, I know that of myself, humanly speaking, I can perish. And I am determined to take strength from everlasting nourishment, which is the connectedness that I have with my Father in heaven through the Holy Spirit. And it tells us he is hungry, which means he is prepared humanly as possible for this trial, this confrontation. And when the devil comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. He immediately strikes at his sense of identity, his sense of belonging. But of course, because he is connected, because he is, quote, 
immersed, filled with, consumed with, connected by the Holy Spirit. Something like this just does not speak to him. If you're the son of God, of course I'm the son of God. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I know who my creator was. Why do you know that so well? Because I live in prayer moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. Everything that is anything like a question, I respond with, okay, what would Jesus have me do? What does the Father in heaven want of me? And so his response, sustaining life depends more. Uh, it's not just by bread alone. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Where did you get that from? From the scriptures inspired by my Father in heaven, by the scriptures which... I've known from my youth, from the response I feel in prayer when I read the Word of God and it becomes part of me. Oh, okay, you got an answer to that, an answer that was prepared. Man shall not live on bread alone. I won't amuse, abuse the miracle working power for personal use. Uh, I am the Son of God, but that doesn't mean to say I'm going to get my own way on my own terms. You know, God has a plan and a purpose, and not all the details are necessarily clear to me at this particular moment, but a lot of them are, and ones that flow from that are fairly logical and reasonable, and I have faith that what is coming is the will of God. I know I was speaking to one lady uh, uh, this last week, and she said she was part of a prayer group that had prayed earnestly for peace in the Ukraine, and she perhaps naively, in fact, she admitted very naively, thought, well, tomorrow war will cease. And it didn't, and it hasn't, and it will not until there is some sort of selfish determination on the part of Mr. Putin. I can get some of what I want, and then I won't push any further, or I'm getting all that I want, and uh, I'll live with the rest for now until I have another go at this in a few years' time. And if the fools on the other side say, oh, well, that solves everything, peace in our time, then, of course, we will have another bout of this as he looks to Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, Hungary, what used to be Czechoslovakia, all those areas, Yugoslavia as well. Hey, it was good here. I'll just keep going. Okay? Jesus said, it is not my determination. There is more to life than just getting bread. Bread is provided. Bread is part of the response to being human. But there's more than that, and this is what I know from the words of God. And so it was, we had a long discussion about what does it mean to pray? Is the answer no, an answer to prayer? Or is the answer to understand that God has sort of set this world in motion, he's given us free will, and he's said to us, okay, do it your way, until you understand that you need to ask what my way would be. We know what his way is because we have embraced the truth. We have connected with Jesus. We are hopefully living as much and as enthusiastically as we can in the spirit. But, you know, we're not all the way there yet. And with Jesus, he is all the way there. Man shall not live by bread alone. And so the devil led him up to a high place and showed him an inst uh, in an instant all the kingdoms of this world. And he said to him, you, you came to reclaim all of humanity. You came to put your arms around all creation. You know, looking back from the ultimate statement in John, God so loved the world that he gave. Looking back on the words of Jesus now, I beg your pardon, Paul, who said, in his sacrifice he has reconciled all things in heaven and in earth. And Satan said, I'll just give up. I won't perpetrate evil. I won't do the things that I do. I have a certain, quote, purview, authority, opportunity myself. I'll give it all to you. I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Now, Jesus knows that, well, this is not exactly the way it should be done. You know, what is Mr. Putin's goal? It's a worldview that he has. I'm going to seize power. Uh, Jesus has a worldview. I'm going to 
embrace and bring with power all of humanity to myself. But there's a way it should be done. And the Father in heaven has not said, you do it by conquering, you do it by compromising, you do by just, oh, look, I can do it quick and easy. No. And Jesus answers to him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's the response. Oh, so there's a way to doing. You know, that lady, we had a discussion. Of course, she was coming to that understanding herself. But faith, the Father in heaven, faith, just as Jesus ultimately shows us in the words, not my will, but yours be done. Not my way, but yours be done. Not my schedule, but yours be followed. And so this is what we are seeing revealed here the reality of living in a broken world. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point. Again, the doubt. If you are the Son of God, doesn't it say in the Scripture, you know, throw yourself here. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They'll lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Again, yeah, doubting. Are you sure about your own identity are you sure about this commitment that you have and that he has to you? Are, can you really justify all of this sacrifice and accepting of all of these realities of the wilderness? Is it God's intent and purpose that you turn the other cheek? Is it his t intent and purpose that you submit to unjust authority? Is it God's intent and purpose that you pay this money in taxes? I just did my income tax. Oh, you they. They want, they want some back. I got a little here, got a little there. They want, they want it back. Oh, man. Come on. I didn't anticipate. I knew there was some that had to go there and some had to go there, but that much? Really? I'm embarrassed. Uh, can you pay it? Well, yeah, I can, but I'd rather not do that. Like, and you, you laugh, but you do your taxes next week and see how you feel. All right? You'll feel my pain. I, down, I downloaded TurboTax because there are half a dozen people I help out, and uh, it's really easy to put, put it through. So I did mine, got it organized here, did my wife's. And, uh, uh, ouch, you know, they didn't hold enough here. They don't withhold any there. They don't withhold any. And now it comes back to haunt me. There must be a way to avoid this. No, Justin, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, <laughs> you know this started, oh, man. All right. All right. Okay, well, you know, surely we could just, you know, and so all of this, you know, Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, Bob, don't push your luck. Mm -hmm. Don't try to avoid, don't cut corners. Don't do this. It is the nature of the Holy Spirit to ask and answer the question, Act with integrity as though you were God in the flesh, as though God were working through your flesh. Act with honesty and integrity. Act as Jesus would act. Yeah, but he does things so properly. And he never had the problems I had. He never had the temptations I have. Oh, really? Yes, he did. Could he have cheated on his taxes? Could he have cut corners? Could, yeah, of course he could. Would he? No, because he is entirely connected with the Holy Spirit in the same way, Bob, you should be. Well, how's that? Well, do you live in prayer? Do you live in an act of worship? Do you consider your entire life a living sacrifice to the God in heaven who has redeemed you and promised you everlasting life with him? And it's already begun. You have entered into that everlasting life. The kingdom is here and now for you. Uh, I wish you hadn't put it that way. Yeah, well, I did. So deal with it. Embrace it. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until the next time. Literally, the devil said, I'll be back. Why? Because he never really quits. And the flesh never really quits. The human nature that has been formed by Adam's participation in the lies which he was given 
have you ever thought of this? That you could do it your own way. You know, you don't have to do it your father's way. But he created me. Yeah, but, you know, the next generation does things differently. They move on. They innovate. They do things. And so from this, we have what is called the fall. We have human nature. We have the flesh. But Paul uses the expression sarks, which means more than flesh. Although flesh is quite enough to cope with. As I said, the flesh says chocolate. Oh, okay, how do I feel about that? Uh, you know, I say to the flesh, let's fast. And the flesh responds, hey, in your dreams. Okay, that's the way that works out. Well, okay, but then there's the world, which is a collection of millions of me. And working with each other, we can convince each other that there are different ways to do things. And so we battle against the flesh. We battle against the world. And then... There is, and apparently this is a real, quote, person, a real being. And, and throughout Scripture, it's not just a sort of a condescension. It's not just a philosophical accommodation. It is a real, honest, malevolent presence called the devil. And he is after you. Uh, he, not all the time. Yeah, he's got other people he likes to persecute. But you sit down, and as I think it's James or Peter or John, one of those, okay, maybe it was Paul. Did I cover enough? <laughs> Who said, be careful that when you sit down at the dinner table, you don't set that chair for the unseen guest, but you set that chair, you give place to the devil because he is happy to come and join your dinner conversation. He's happy to come and give input. I said that the title of the sermon was Jesus Facing Temptation in the Wilderness. You and I face that every day. We are in the wilderness, but we are not in a spiritual wilderness. We're in the wilderness of this world, but we have the spiritual guidance, the presence of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean to say we aren't going to wrestle against the flesh, be put upon by the world, and from time to time, even challenged by Satan himself. How are we doing? Well, as I said, for moments, like that Polish school teacher, we may rise to the heights for a moment. Uh, like that Ukrainian mother who turns her back to the bullets to shield her child, we may rise to that. And fortunately, when we do not rise to those moments, there is the grace of God who says, despite the possibility of your heroism, I have risen to those heights for you, and I will lift you to those heights myself. And as you think of the challenges of being in this spiritual wilderness, you take the, the pattern, the advice, the footsteps of Jesus, and you follow in those footsteps. And even when you fail, you thank him that he has succeeded. You know, Israel, the son who failed, Jesus, the son who succeeded, has put his arms around you and he's lifted you to the heights of heaven. And he's seated you in heavenly places. And he said, do not be distracted by your temptations and your failures, because with my help you will move past temptation. And even when you stumble, I am there to lift you up. But if you live in the power of the Spirit, if you live in communication through prayer and through constantly feeling the direction and guidance of God in your life, you will soar above certain things. And even when you crash, he will lift you up and cause you to soar past those moments of doubt and failure and disappointment. And he will see you through this journey of the spiritual wilderness of this world to the spiritual reality of everlasting life. As you consider what Jesus has accomplished for you, consider what he can accomplish with you. And in prayer, maybe in fasting from time to time, and in devotion to the scriptures, which Jesus was quick to quote, you will find that he will lead you on to everlasting life. A gift he has already granted and which you're walking towards. And once again, the reassurance that even if you stumble, he didn't. Even if temptation overwhelms for a moment, he resisted, and in his victory, you have eternity secure. 
Let's take his example and think about it some more this coming week. And think as we journey towards his ultimate sacrifice at the cross that thankfully he's made that for us and made all of this possible. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we go into this story with depth and try to understand, we are comforted knowing that uh, our high priest has intervened for us and in the perfection of his life, his death, and his resurrection, our Savior has accomplished for us everlasting life. He has saved us, and he has reconciled us to you, our Father in heaven. And we thank you for that today. We ask your comfort and strength for this coming week. We ask that you could shine through us as ambassadors for your kingdom, as ones who instinctively know what we are facing in this wilderness of this world, and instinctively feel your presence and know that you, the Holy Spirit, are going to strengthen and guide us and comfort us and lead us. As we go through this, we ask that the depth and meaning of this particular story should come through to us as a reality, and that reality would be with us as we live out this calling that you've given us and this future you've granted to us. We thank you for that today in our Savior's name. and We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's close.